organized and they were successful and which they rounded about um, uh, pertinent topics such as conflict resolution education, um, enjoyable learning environment, uh, top, top ways to teach uh, challenging grammar lessons and integrating skills and aspects. So uh, this is the agenda for uh, today's evening, for uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, we have number one, games for formative assessment, which we, uh, will be introduced by Mrs. Brian and Rogers from the United States. And then we move on to improving learning English through games by uh, Mr. Abdul Qadr Shidudi from Morocco. And number three, uh, uh, Mrs. George Kokolas from Greece is going to tackle the topic of gamification, practical application for EFL learners. And then we move on to um, the importance of using games to teach English by Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Habibat Dawdi from Algeria. And finally, Hussein uh, Qasiras is going to provide us with uh, tips, uh, top tips to use in games in FL classrooms. So uh, I have a word for, uh, for the audience there will be an opportunity for, uh, for asking questions after each presentation and uh, a general discussion uh, will be at the end. And please make sure you, uh, you state your questions clearly and uh, uh, along with your name and where you are from. And our guest speakers will do their best to, to answer your questions and inquiries in, in possible ways. And again, do not forget to send us your emails in the, uh, uh, in the chat uh, section below so that we can send you each certificates as soon as possible. Uh, again, uh, this is, I, I, I rely on you. I count, I count on you to, to do the sharing, try to tag as many friends as possible so that everybody can watch. Okay, so let's, let's get to it. Uh, there is no shadow of a doubt that using games have a learning value as well as boost motivation and brings a lot of fun to the classroom. So in this webinar, uh, our distinguished speakers shall address and answer questions related to game-based learning uh, approach, gamification, classroom appropriate games, assessment through games, and top tips to using games in the classroom and of course, other aspects related to the topic at hand. So uh, I guess uh, we are, we're going to cover a bunch of ideas actually. So before we give it a go, uh, I'd love to give an overview about what GBF is and what it does. So maybe this is for those who don't know GBF. So GBF is an acronym for uh, Global Bus Foundation. Uh, it is a non-governmental organization which is based in Morocco. It aims at empowering both and youth lead and teachers by offering high quality services such as giving presentations, or conducting workshops, offering TEFL courses as well as organizing seminars. Uh, in this dynamic body, we empower both teachers and youths in, with the necessary skills uh, related to leadership, global education, peace building. We are also uh, advocates of the 21st century skills. We not only work uh, globally, but also we, we, we not only work at the local level, but also we work globally. So uh, GBF has, has trained and coached both youth and teachers in several countries uh, like uh, India, China, Vietnam, Tunisia, and Spain. So. Uh, we are building a sound reputation through a high profile presence. Okay, so now uh, the floor, I will give the floor to the first presenter, but before uh, uh, the first presentation, which will be about games for formative assessment by Mrs. Brian Rogers. So please, please allow me to uh, introduce Brian Rogers. Uh, Brian Rogers has, uh, has been working in in the education sector in Southeast Asia for the last 10 years. She has worked as a trainer and a trainer of trainees for programs with the Ministry of Education in Malaysia and Tunisia. She's a private consultant for the United States Department of State, 
working on projects in Laos, Indonesia, and Timor-Leste, as well as on a global project for U.S. embassies, American spaces. Um, Brianna Rogers, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to share my screen so we can get started. Um, Lucene, it says I can't share my screen. So if you could hit the enable, please. So as I said, I'm actually here. Yeah. I'm from the United States um, and I'm from Oregon, but I'm actually living in Laos and have been working in Southeast Asia for over the last 10 years and doing teacher training. And let's see, can I share my screen yet? Still yeah, can't. yeah, you can share now. You are allowed. You can't? Okay, let me try again. Yeah, what about now? On. There you go. Yes. Great. All right. So here we go. So games for formative assessment with me. All right. We're going to go on to the next slide. So very easy question for everyone. What is formative assessment? And most people are very familiar with this term nowadays. Formative assessment is basically monitoring our students' learning while we are in the class. Um, it means that we want to make sure that we can improve our instruction while the students are learning so that we are meeting their needs. It is looking more at the quality of our of the learning that is happening, the quality of our teaching, um, but mainly what learning is happening rather than the quantity. So normally when we do tests and quiz and all the more you know, executive assessments type things, we're looking at more the qu quantity of what our students know. We're formative. We want to look at the quality. So we want to make sure that our, what our learners know before we move on. So we want to learn, make sure that we um, make, making sure that our learners know before we as teachers go on to the next thing. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to keep this sort of fun and easy for you today and give you some ideas of how you can do formative um, games for formative assessment. So the first game is called one of these things is not like the other and this is a very easy one as a teacher all you will need to do is think of a list of four things so exactly four things um, that do not belong um, then what you're going to do is sorry say three things that do not belong three things that belong and one thing that does not belong and your students then have to identify which one doesn't belong all right and they can either do this verbally through telling you the answer or um, another thing i like to do is use these sort of easy folders that are very cheap put some white paper in them and they work as whiteboards so a very easy way to make whiteboards for your students to write on and they can show you the answer so for example, I'm going to ask um, everyone who's out there in, on Facebook, um, if I give you four words, and the four words are going to be apple, banana, blue, pear. Which one doesn't belong? All right, so for that example, what we would have is blue doesn't belong. So that's a very easy one. We're going to make it just a little more difficult. And that's going to be um, ankle, sorry. Yeah, ankle, finger, heel, toe. Again, ankle, finger, heel, toe. Which one doesn't belong? All right, and hopefully you guys came up with finger. Now, as we get going to maybe some of you who have older students, again, you can use this by going um, through maybe sentences and checking. So again, um, this might seem very simple, but the students actually really do get engaged. They're very, they're listening to you. 
um, and wanting to find the answer that doesn't belong. So the next one is um, four sentences. Number one, I went to London. Two, I've never been to Paris. Three, I've visited Rome. And four, I lived in Laos. Which one doesn't belong? And hopefully you've come up with the realization that it was number one, I went to London. Now, to make this even more complicated or to really check students' understanding of what you're going over, a very important question is why? So if your students came up with, I went to London as the wrong answer or the one that doesn't belong, then you would wanna ask them why. So very easy game, no preparation, easy way to check what your students have learned. The next one is called four corners. You put four signs around the room. So you have A, B, C, and D. Then you very simply make multiple choice questions. All right. So you would maybe ask your students, um, is this, oh, hopefully everyone can see, is this a shark, A, a shark, B, a clam, C, a crab, or D, a whale. The students are all standing in the center of the room. They decide which corner they want to run to. So you are checking, it's a very easy way to check vocabulary, or if you have a test that sort of gets boring to study for and you want to again, see what they're learning, multiple choice, A, B, C, D, even your older kids and your older students will enjoy standing up and getting to move to the corner that matches the answer. So for this one, of course, we'd want them to go to letter, I do believe it was D, which was the whale. One thing that is important to do as a teacher, especially when you are working with younger students for this activity, is to make sure you are watching your students' reactions. So you can see, are they having to think a lot? Are they following just what other people are doing? Or are they actually thinking and understanding? So again, four corners, a very easy game to set up. You just need the signs for A, B, C, D. Have your students get to the center of the game. And then you give them a um, the four cho multiple choices and they go to the corner that they think is the right answer. So that's four corners. Next, we're going to play a very traditional game and that is going to be tic-tac-toe. Um, for those of you who have had British teachers, you might have heard this called knots and crosses. Um, at the bottom of the screen, I do have the website that I got this from. What you are trying to do is you are trying to get three um, in a row. So either across, sorry, across, diagonal, or up and down. Again, acro across, diagonal, or up and down. And the students, this is all on um, PowerPoint, so it makes it nice, you can do it ahead. This one is to check for, are they understanding? Um, the past tense. So I would ask students, um, divide them into two teams. One team is going to be X's and one team is going to be O's. And I will ask team X maybe to go first. Please tell me one of the words. They might say run. What is the past tense? Ran. And if they get it right, they were X's, so they get an X in their spot. O's now get to go. And I, again, choose what one they want. They decide to go say, teach. And what is the past tense of teach? Can't hear anyone out there I'm trying to look at my comments. Um, but it's going to be taught, so they get an O. The next group goes, X's again. They say they want to do think, what is the past tense of think? And they say thunk. Oh, too bad. Thunk is not the right answer. So they don't get an X. We go on to O again. Have, past tense. They know had, they get an O. X, 
goes for pay. So they know the past tense is paid. X. O does C, past tense saw. X, this time they've talked together, they know think, and the past tense is thought. So they have three in a row and yay, they win. I have done this with all ages of students from university to my university professors that I've done teacher training with to six year olds in primary school. And this is again, just a very fun, you can just put the grid on your chalkboard and there is no prep. After they do this, I usually have the students make their own grids and they play in pairs. Or again, what you can do is make your own sort of whiteboard. This is just copies that I always keep on hand. And the students then can pass these around and pay, play. So this one is for prepositions. This one is uh, practice some and any. And again, with this little plastic sheet, everyone can do whiteboard and it erases and they can play again and again. So tic-tac-toe, very good um, for checking your formative assessment, making sure that they have understood. You can put synonyms in there so you can give them adjectives and they have to give you the opposites or they have to give you synonyms. You can do example like this one where you put sentences in and they have to do a gap fill. So again, many different ways to use that game. The next one, um, I think almost every culture I've, um, country I've been to and most cultures have an example of rock, scissors, paper. That's what we call it in the States. So you have rock, you have scissors, and you have paper. And this is a very simple game where you go one, two, three, Everyone choose, um, usually two, two people play, sorry, two people are playing, two students are playing, they go one, two, three, and they choose either rock, scissors, paper. And the way it goes is that um, rock beats scissors, scissors beat paper, and paper beats rock. So rock breaks scissors, scissors cut paper paper can cover rock now this might not seem like hmm there's not a lot of english involved so what i like to do this for is i have two teams that come up the first two people in the team in the line they play rock scissors paper now the twist is the winner not the loser the winner gets to answer a question for their team and then you mark if they get it right and you get to see who has has it right so it's a competition so the next once they've played the next two people come up rock scissors paper they see who what who wins the winner again answers the question so you can again use this for almost anything i also have done this where in your textbook where it's a very boring, maybe they've done a reading and then there's 10, say 10 reading um, comprehension questions or you've been doing grammar and they need to answer the grammar questions. So rather than just sitting at their desk writing away, they, you get them into pairs, they do rock, scissors, paper, and whoever, again, whoever wins has to answer the question in their textbook. So, um, it makes it a lot of fun. I was very surprised I did this with a group of high school students. Um, and the next day I went back into class and without me even saying, I said, okay, open your textbooks because they were going to work on some things. They automatically paired up and started want wanting to play rock, scissors, paper. So again, very simple things, just make your basic sort of Oh, some of the boring things, a quiz, you could give them a quiz and they just do rock, scissors, paper to who answers it. It makes it a little more exciting and a little more fun. And again, no preparation on your hand. end. All right, this one is more for kids, most definitely. We call it blow. What you do is you have the kids make a butterfly 
maybe something else, but I like to make, have them draw a butterfly. You cut it out, you place it on the floor. So you'll have say, you'll make four or five teams depending on your class size, maybe more, but you don't wanna have too big a teams. Um, they place it on one, the, the butterfly on one end of the classroom on the end of the uh, on the other end of the classroom is another um, line which is the end line the students you will ask them a question whoever answers it correctly first they get to <laughs> blow on their butterfly the butterfly moves across the floor um, and whoever gets their butter the team that gets their butterfly across the floor first wins so every time they answer a question right they get to blow on their butterfly. And it's a lot of fun. The kids are laughing. You have to be very careful though. They'll try to blow a little extra. Um, but one thing that's very nice is that even a team that may be not so good, if they can really give a good blow, they'll actually catch up. So it's nice um, on being a little more for students who might need a little more help or if you have a team that happens to have some of your weaker students in it. So again, just a very fun one for mainly primary school students. The next one is called Stack'em. Um, often we have see this game called Jenga. It's the same thing, the wooden blocks, where you stack the blocks and you have to take one block out. So to make this interactive, what we've done is written sentences or questions on the block. Um, I have a few sets of these, or I, I used to have a few sets of, set of these. Um, one with verbs, so people would have to use the past tense verb or they'd have to make a sentence using the verb. Um, same with adjectives or with the different um, vocabulary that they had. So the way you do this is they play Jenga or the wooden stacks, just the way you normally play where you take one little block out and then you need to balance it on the top but before you can they take it out they read the question or the word that's on the block they do whatever it is you've asked them so either answering the question making a sentence with that verb um, changing the verb to the past tense again using synonyms they say that word if they get it correct they get it added to the stack if they get it wrong, they keep the, the wooden block. So when the, when the thing finally collapses, the winner is the person with the least amount of blocks. Again, um, I need to re, re, want to reiterate that as a teacher with all these games, it's not about you sitting there and watching what your students are doing. It's about you monitoring what your students are saying how easy they are following the um, the games um, and how they are doing. So um, this one again works really well. I've used it from university students to younger students as well. Um, and they all love it. And again, they think that they're playing and not that you're actually paying attention to see what they, what they know before you move on. The last one, um, the game that I'm going to give you is called Don't Speak. You have all your students sit in a big circle. And what you will do is ask the student, you will point to one student um, and you will ask them a question, but they cannot speak. The person who gets the point is the person either on their left or the right who answers first. So the student, your students, your learners really have to pay attention to you because you'll call someone's name, ask them a question, the people hurt the other learners either to the left or to the right have to answer that question. So again, it's a very good way to review if you have a test coming up. It's a good way to review after the end of a unit you can, again, have them answer, fill in the blanks, um, do gap fills, um, do grammar, and or just read a passage if it's a word or give them flashcards and they have to identify what the word is. 
So if I said the girl in the middle is named Tracy, I would say, Tracy, what is this? And either the girl on the left or the boy on the right would have to answer the question, not the one in the middle. And again, as easy as this might sound, the students are very geared toward answering our questions. So um, that was my last game. And I think I had my 20 minutes, so I didn't want to, I tried to keep it short and sweet. Um, but I hope that those games are all games that you can just go, there are no preparation. Um, if you want to make your, you know, tic-tac-toe cards or something that takes a little prep, but really any of those games, you can go into your classrooms tomorrow and try. And that's what I was hoping to accomplish is just to give you something that's very practical, um, very low prep, um, and that you can just go and have fun. And again, a lot of these, a lot of times when you think games are just for kids, you would be surprised how many times I've had adult students who love some of these sillier games as well. We all just like to have fun. We, they don't even realize that we're checking to see what they know um, and that you know they're just enjoying and using the English a lot more naturally than on a quiz or on a written exam. And again, what I wanna say is um, this is all about formative assessment, which is about quality of what learning is that we want to know what our students know before we go onto our next unit, that we shouldn't worry about the qu quantity of what we're teaching. We wanna worry about our quality. And if our students are struggling with some of these games, then that means, hey, as a teacher, I need to go back, I need to review, I need to help my students really learn this, not just um, on the surface level, I wanna see deep learning happening. So I hope you have fun with these games and I hope that you get to try them tomorrow. Like I said, I wanted to do a bunch of no prep games. Uh, this is my information. Um, again, my name is Brianna Rogers. Uh, my email is educationalconsultantbrianna at gmail.com. Uh, my Facebook is teacher trainer Brianna. Um, you can also look up Teach, Learn, Grow, which is a Facebook group that I run and administer and put up a lot of professional de development ideas there and also included my LinkedIn account. So thank you for your time and uh, everyone have a, um, a great rest of the session. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Brian Rogers for your fruitful presentation and interactive games you have presented. Uh, this shows us that uh, uh, chicken understanding, chicken understanding of the students, it's, it depends, uh, you can do it in a fun way rather than uh, writing questions. So thank you very much. Uh, I guess you have some questions for you, Mrs. Brian and Rogers. Okay, we have okay. question, All right. Uh, question for you. So we have here uh, a question from uh, Shu'aib from Agadir from Morocco. How much okay. time should we give? How much time should we give to games in a lecture? And what is the appropriate moment to do games? Okay, so um, especially in a lecture, it's going to be a little hard depending on your situation. Um, I usually like to do them after a major learning point. Um, I want to give students time to really absorb what's learned. So oftentimes they're towards the end of a class or at the end of an important um, learning point for them is what I would say. How much time um, you can have games. And again, if you think and you are prepped, some of these games will take longer at first. For example, tic-tac-toe. When I first do it with my students, it takes about maybe 20 minutes and they get going. But then when I put it up on the board again, the next lecture or the next class, I can only, I only have to spend like say five minutes on the game just to get the idea. So it depends on how, you, how many times you've played that game before, but always the first time it's going to take a little bit longer. Then after that, they go really quickly. Okay. So this is the questions I received uh, for the moment. 
Hello? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, the guest speakers, please, in the, Zoom, in, the, in the Zoom space, do you have any questions for Brianna Rogers, uh, according uh, in relation to what she, in the presentation she gave? In time, we'll receive other questions from the audience. Um, any, questions? Have... any questions from, yes, Kassel, go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's, um, it's really very interesting to use games in the classroom, okay, for the, um, for the sake of motivating and engage yes. our learners. But the, sometimes using games may have uh, some drawbacks, okay, concerning healthy and unhealthy noise. So how could you um, overcome or how could you avoid students um, making a lot of noise that we call unhealthy noise when you are playing games in the classroom. So what techniques that you use exactly so as to avoid this, this issue or this problem? Okay, well, one, it would depend on the students. Um, I would say if it's unhealthy noise, I have never heard that term before. One is that you've already established roles um, in the classroom. Two, usually students like to play games. And so if there is where it becomes so out of control um, that we want to, um, that we can't handle it, then we just stop the game. And we learn that if you are not going to play the game correctly, then we aren't going to play it at all. Um, the thing that I ran into when I've done teacher training before is uh, I guess my concept of what is healthy noise and uh, what is unhealthy noise is also very different from a lot of other teachers. To me, if my students are laughing, having fun, that's a healthy noise. And I'll have other teachers come in and sort of complain and I'll be like, hey, five minutes, we're having fun. They're speaking, they're trying. I let it go. I'm, you know, that's the thing. Um, I think one of the other misconceptions that our games are necessarily we're trying to make English fun and games are not necessary. It's, I always have, I've started um, changing my terminology from games to activities, just because a lot of times people have this misconstruction that games mean fun, that learning is not taking place, but that's not the case. It is that learning is taking place. So um, I hope that answered your question. Great. Thank you. Very Thank clear. you very much. So here is one more question from the audience. Uh, he, uh, from Ashraf Dikdak. How should we introduce a game to the students to understand how it works in order to get the gist of it? All right. So a lot of this takes modeling. So if you can get maybe two of your higher level students to help you play the game first and model it. Also, it takes slow instructions. Um, today, when I was introducing to you, I was going fairly fast on my instructions. But with the students, I would go step by step. As English teachers, we have a tendency to give all our instructions at one time and say, okay, let's play. And students go, oh, we need to go slowly. We go one step, does everyone understand? Okay, let's check to make sure everyone understands. All right, next step. Let's go to the next step. And we go step by step and we go slowly, always again, checking understanding of those instructions. And like I said at the end, it's go there's going to be mistakes at first. There's not, it probably won't get played quite correctly the first time. And you know what? That's okay. As long as the students are talking and you're getting some sort of result the first time, it's great. But as they get familiar with it each time you introduce it, it will become easier and easier for you to do in the classroom. A lot of times students are not used to being able to do an activity, to get up and move around the classroom. So it's uncomfortable for them as well. So we need to make sure, you know, understand that our students are learning a different way of learning also. So it's new for everyone and just to be, go slow, have patience, but don't give up. Don't say, oh, I tried it once and it didn't work. Always go back and say, what can I do differently? How can I maybe make that work better for my situation? Thank you very much for your, uh, your nice feedback and your clear instruction. Sadly, uh, yes. Can, so, I just, can I just comment on uh, Brianna's uh, 
presentation, please. Okay, okay, sir, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm uh, Shadudi Abqadir, ELT supervisor in Saleh. Uh, I'd like first to uh, say hello to the, uh, to the panelists and to your audience, uh, starting from Habiba, George, Hussein, Brian, Ali, and all of uh, all, uh, all, all, all the audience. Yeah, okay, uh, 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 it was ex excellently presented. Uh, that's uh, it's not uh, as we say with throwing flowers by because uh, because it, you took us to directly to the classroom it's it's uh, it's more of a, a, a practical ideas uh, i mean for teachers ready made uh, ideas for teachers to start and using games uh, by your perspective i'm afraid it's a bit different from what i'm going to present in a few seconds or a few minutes depending uh, is you, you consider uh, games or using games as a reinforcement or a sort of uh, uh, using it for uh, uh, formative assessment. Uh, maybe um, I have a different view using uh, using games as a teaching tool. So that's the, the only yes. perhaps. Uh, thank you for that. And that's the thing, that's the great thing about games is they are versatile. So you can use them as teaching tools. Um, and I think when you're doing formative assessment, that's what you're doing also is reinforcing the learning. So that's one reason they work so well with formative assessment is because it's not a final assessment. It is a formative assessment to see what they know and what else we need to go over and review. So yes, I agree with you. They're great for, they're great for throughout the class. So yeah, thank great, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So uh, uh, before we give the floor to the second presenter, please, uh, a word to the uh, online attendees. Uh, please uh, try to ask questions after each presentation and make sure you write your name and uh, your country. Uh, and thank you very much. So uh, we move on to the second uh, presentation, which, is a, which will be about improving uh, learning English through games which will be presented by uh, Mr. Abdelkader uh, Shdudi. So uh, let me introduce Mr. Abdelkader uh, Shdudi. He's an LT supervisor in Saleh and teacher trainer at the Faculty of Education in Rabat. He has been training EFL teachers of all categories uh, for nearly two decades. He holds a BA degree from Mohammed V University in Rabat and a TESOL diploma from Moray House College of Education Eden in Edinburgh, and a DEA in Applied Linguistics from the Faculty of Education in Rabat. His main interests include competency-based uh, instruction, curriculum design, ICT, and assessment. He's currently working on different educational projects. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abqadar. You, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Sally. Okay, can I share? Uh, can I share the? Yes. Can I just... Yes, you can. Is it okay now? No, not yet. Uh, yes, now you can share, Mr. Abdelkader. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah, can yeah, you... you can share. Yes. Can you see uh, the, the slides? No, not yet. Not yet, so it's uh, uh -huh. okay. Is this okay? Yes, it's clear. Just make it uh, the full screen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this all right? Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I think I have uh, already introduced myself and said hello, hello to you. So my presentation is a bit, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's a little of uh, theory. Okay. A little theory of, of, of the use of games. So fostering English learning games, uh, English learning through games, uh, because perhaps it's because of the perspective of each uh, uh, environment. Uh, we, we feel that in our environment, teachers are not uh, using games too much in uh, language teaching. That's why uh, it, it makes the perspective ch change from one person to another, okay? Uh, first, 
Okay, uh, I, I, I talk a little bit, I use a little introduction and then talk about these uh, five points. The use of games in class, uh, what we mean by games exactly, uh, or how can games really improve uh, learning, what kind of games to use, and few recommendations, very few recommendations for teachers. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, joining Brian's ideas, okay, I can ask this question here. Yes, not all teaching ought to be game-based, but all classroom games should be learning-oriented. So I don't know exactly, I, I don't have time to, to deal on that because I have only 20 minutes, but this is just for reflection, okay? Uh, next, an overview. Uh, we believe that all human beings have this tendency to, uh, the, to play and to have fun. It's, it's a very natural thing for all people, okay? Uh, and especially for uh, uh, kids, uh, primary school children, and even adults, teenagers in high school, all people, okay, want to play, okay? Uh, so it's a very natural thing. It's commonly believed that using games presupposes the increase. So we intuitively believe that using games increases uh, uh, or, to, or helps raise the standards for students' attainment. But the, the, the big question, games are not parts of the syllabus apart from the few uh, uh, puzzles or few uh, things, game-like uh, exercises that we have in the textbook. So for, for us teaching English, okay, we know the textbooks, we have so many textbooks, but the place of games is uh, just almost neglected. So how can teachers uh, think of using games? So um, the second question, which is related to, uh, to C here, uh, on what basis would uh, teachers integrate games and how are they supposed to use those games? Or, or how often would they use them? So uh, percept perceiving, per perceiving games uh, would be different from perhaps different in a sense from teachers and students. For teachers, okay, uh, uh, very, they, they think that it's very, uh, very important for uh, studying. It, it would help them differentiate instruction. It can help them uh, and help students, uh, especially reserve students to come out of the shell, as we say. Or, uh, but they think that finding the appropriate games is not an easy matter and could be time consuming. Uh, and would also require a lot of classroom management to, to, to implement. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the also, uh, the, it's not like when the design or designing or devising a lesson plan. It's it, for games, you, you would find it very hard for teachers to really uh, think of uh, plan B easily. And sometimes it would uh, it would need some uh, some of uh, financial support, perhaps. Uh, that's for students on, on the other side. They may think that it's just fun playing, but uh, they don't know that they are doing some uh, some learning at the same time. But little by little, little they would realize this fact that their energy is uh, invested in the tasks they are completing if they are in the form of, of games, of course, we are talking about games. They would feel competitive, but not in this, uh, they should not be in the negative sense. Uh, uh, they, they, they would also be in an environment where they would be very cooperative, being in groups, working together, helping one another. That's all very interesting in a classroom. Uh, uh, but perhaps they would also realize that what they are learning uh, is linked to the outside world, real uh, life values that they are uh, acquiring, in fact. Next, uh, the first question, what use gaming class? This, uh, uh, obviously you have an answer for that. But um, when I, the first thing I thought of when I was uh, trying to, 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 to prepare this presentation uh, was we use, uh, I, I, I thought of Mary Poppins uh, saying, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Okay, uh, that, mean, uh, that, that means to us that learning is, uh, is a bit bitter thing. Okay, it's sour, you cannot swallow it. So what we need as teachers 
in our classroom is to, uh, uh, to infuse games in the teaching process so that uh, learning would be uh, smooth, okay, seamless. Uh, but I also thought of this one here in an environment in the classroom here presented like this, in, where there is anxiety, lack of motivation, boredom, and interesting texts and interesting uh, activities. So what would we do, for example, okay? This is why we use games. Language input is found, uh, is available. Teachers are doing their best to provide all the, 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 the resources to provide the learning experiences, but there is no learning taking place. So the output would be very little, very minimal. Okay, we, we would not find a lot of intake on the part of the students. It's, it's why? Because they are blocked. They are blocked here. And this is not my idea. This is crash and monitor hypothesis. I just reverse the ideas so that you would understand it that the other way. Uh, so the affective filter is what crash and uh, 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 advocates that could be uh, either help or, uh, or, or block language learning, language acquisition uh, precisely. So this, if the environment, okay, we, we talk about high and low affective filter. But it's, if it's high, there is little learning. And if it's slow, there is a lot of learning taking place. So students are happy. So I thought to put it in another, another shape, uh, perhaps this, this could uh, justify why EFL teachers should use games, because games function uh, uh, as uh, uh, the, the, they try to minimize the, the anxiety fraud environment. They, they help the affective filters be low and make learning more permeable. They, they help students learn. So lowering the, uh, the, the, those are the reasons. Lowering the affective filter, motivation, help, help uh, uh, motivating students to, to meet the challenge of learning, engaging them and uh, committing them to the learning uh, process, replicating reality through, uh, to, uh, I don't know what uh, I wrote here, uh, uh, pretend play, I remember it, uh, true pretend play or uh, role play, fostering sense of observation, developing listening skills. When they are listening to one another, to the, the instructions of the teachers, how to carry on a play. Reacting to prompts, okay, uh, the same as listening and reacting at the same time and standing language of games. Uh, develop, developing retention and memory span, controlling mo monitoring skill, uh, and socializing, being in groups and, uh, and dynamics, and acquiring somehow leadership skills uh, when involved in games. The second question, what do games do, have, what, do what games do we have in mind? So when we, we, when we pronounce the word game, what do we mean exactly? Because games can, can be from a, foot, uh, a football match, a game, to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you can also think of physical games, paper-based ones, digital ones. Okay, we, all these are games. So I start with uh, number four, video games. Those that are, are reputed to be, uh, to have negative effect most of the time. That's why uh, we, we have teachers, parents not advising uh, uh, students not to use them. Although some research, okay, prove it that they could have some positive effects on, uh, on uh, kids and children. So is it physical uh, ones allowing students to move in class and perform like the one Brian suggested? Okay, blowing the, the butterfly, that's, uh, that's okay. Uh, or paper bases using uh, cards and all digital ones that I would suggest later. Uh, we, we basically have or could think of two types of learning games. A learning game embedded in a game and that's answers some of the questions of uh, embedded in a game, a learning task embedded in a game, or a game encompassing a language learning aspect. So, but both perspectives help students attain uh, and improve. Uh, but this, this, the, 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 this could be proved only through assessment, formative or summative assessment, and later or at a later stage could be considered in experimental research. Uh, 
Next, how can uh, games really improve learning? This is a, another question. I'm asking a question answering them. It's intuitively believed uh, that uh, educational games and play have a positive impact on the brain and learning. So this is a fact, scientific fact. So it's almost 90%, 95%. So those are the ideas that because they are, it triggers and train the brain functions positively. That's uh, a fact. Induce and increase what is called the gray matter, la matière grise in French, or and neurotransmitter receptors. And it also improves visual perception. Okay. Uh, and uh, the last idea, develop attention span and help students pick up conflict resolution strategies. This is also taken from Mary Poppins. But further benefits of games and play on the brain. Okay. That's why I said it could be a bit of theory, a little of theory rather than the practical ideas. So we have this brain, brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is uh, also scientific evidence. Uh, uh, experiments on rats confirmed that games could increase, uh, could help se secrete a substance called the, the BDNF, okay, which stands for brain derived neurotrophic, what is it, neurotrophic factor. And this is very essential in the development of the brain. Uh, this, uh, this BDNF plays an important role in neuronal survival and growth, right? And it also help is very essential for learning and memory. Uh, these, these things are from science and they are 100% they are proven. Positive impacts on games-based learning are adopted from Mary, Mary Poppins again. Just I found the statistics, I'm using them here. So for, it increases self-confidence by 20%. That's uh, improvement of conceptual knowledge by 11% and retention of learning content by 90%. We are interested in this one, retention of learning content and the achievements of practical knowledge, 20% and achievement of the number of completed tasks by 300 times. So I, I would be mostly interested in a retention of learning content and achievements of the number of completed tasks. This would give an idea that, that, that we would have quality quality teaching, quality learning in uh, the, the schools. And it's, it's uh, the same thing is represented here in this graph. I did the representation and it's not uh, Mary Poppins presentation, uh, the representation, I did that. So next, the last, the, the next question, what kind, the one before last, what kind of games to use? Okay, uh, this is a very difficult question, by the way, it's, it's not that easy. So. So when to use games and when, when they are not part of the teaching material, because you, it would be, it would be a, an equation which not easy to, okay, from not easy to solve for teachers. Shall I, okay, cover the program or shall I uh, devote some time for, for uh, games to, to help students reinforce and uh, revise and recycle teaching items? It, it, it's a big question in that, in fact, but we should have some, uh, space in our textbooks where we would find games that are uh, very instructional. So games in the classroom can extend from a very simple uh, uh, riddle to board race, for example, where you have so much uh, noise, uh, students, students rushing to the board to, to uh, write their questions or answers, to, to write their answers. They require group dynamics and co cooperative learning structures. That's uh, I, I mean, those cooperative learning structures, I'm referring to Kagan here, cooperative learning. They have to be aligned with, in accordance with the syllabus somehow. Otherwise, it, it would be a problem for teachers to find time. Focus on language skills and communication. And the last thing is focus on dialogues. This is very practical and very easy for teachers because they have dialogues uh, in the textbooks. They have uh, speaking activities. They, they also have other activities, other skills are targeted. A crucial learning game, they, they pretend, students not only learn communication in English, they acquire also the grammar, the strategic, uh, uh, strategic competence, uh, linguistic competence, and sociolinguistic competence, those uh, mentioned by Hank. 
but also real life skills to survive. Those, you know, those uh, critical uh, skills that we are talking about them for uh, 21st century skills. But for games, this is what I found. Okay, you can, teachers can go to do the, can surf the net, they find thousands uh, of games. They, they can choose from any, uh, 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 the, the plethora of games available on the net to, to, to the ones that suit your teaching points, because you cannot uh, use games just to, as a filling activity. You can use it for a, a real purpose with, with your students. To for uh, when you are teaching, uh, for example, a, a grammar point or a vocabulary point or teaching something, you have to pick and choose the appropriate games from uh, the internet that would be appropriate. So I refer you to two uh, uh, gamified applications here. Uh, Duolingo, you, 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 you might be familiar with those here. Uh, so free, uh, the, the first one is free. It's an education application for learning uh, languages. Teachers can use it in class. And it's, it's, it's very recommended by uh, experts. And the second one, but these are just two, you can find thousands of them. M memorize, uh, this, uh, this is also another application gamified education because to learn languages through locals using, uh, I mean, uh, more than 20,000 native uh, speaking uh, videos, that you would repeat the same thing with different. You can learn so many languages, Spanish, German, uh, French, whatever language. And uh, they are very interesting, in fact, to help students for some self, self learning. They can use it at home, they can use it in class, they can use it depending on what's your, your objective. Uh, uh, finally, I have a few recommendations for teachers, uh, uh, just a few of them. Uh, they, they have to seize uh, any opportunity where the, they would improve their ICT knowledge first because it's very essential in terms of uh, uh, updating their knowledge and their uh, teaching knowledge. Uh, the second one, make, make use of digital tools to promote language learning at all levels, okay, skills levels, yeah, considering speaking, writing, uh, re reading, and uh, all the skills. And uh, to, to be somehow creative in their, in their, in, in their implementation of, uh, of uh, uh, teaching games, they have to search the webs and search the net for applications where that they would themselves try to adapt to their own learning environment. Uh, the digital tools, in fact, uh, I, I have an idea that all the digital tools that we use in class, starting from the interactive whiteboard and smart board, sometimes we, 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 we just say to, to students, don't use your phone. No, but it, it, during the lockdown, all students use their phones, okay? That's one thing. If we train them how to use, yes, that's true. If we train them how to use them during, uh, during no, normal teaching, okay, normal uh, learning classes, they would know how to use that and use the applications, for example. Uh, tablets, e-readers, and headsets, all these the, the, are viewed by students as uh, playing tools. They, they, they can be used as play. Okay, for the interactive board, board, for example, you can have a lot of games that they will stretch their legs, move to the board, and do the games together in groups or individually. Uh, uh, this is to say about that, uh, and this is the final word for that. Thank you very much for your attention. myself. Hello.
Hello. Okay. <laughs> I, I forgot to unmute myself. All right. So thank you very much for uh, for your What's nice. That? For nice and fruitful discussion. Uh, was, was, was I speaking to myself? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Th thank you. Thank you very much for um, for um, uh, bringing about the rationale of using games and also the place of games vis-à-vis -vis the practical concerns of pedagogy in the classroom, and also uh, uh, shedding light on the impact of uh, the positive impact of using games-based learning. Uh, you have actually some questions for you, All right? So we have a question number one from uh, Tina Fields. Um, okay. Um, do you think, uh, Serge Dudy, that gamification gives way to effective learning? If so, what about testing via fun too? Okay. Uh, I guess uh, uh, there is no doubt that when using games, if using games in your teaching would help uh, learners uh, be in a more relaxed atmosphere. And, uh, and as I said, uh, learning would be more permeable. They would, it would be very easy to, for them to, to grasp what they are learning uh, if it's in the form of, uh, uh, of games. Uh, but I'm not talking about games per se, but they have to be learning games, educational games. So uh, it, it, it's a sort of uh, uh, implementing games to the extent of uh, almost forgetting about the borders. This is a game, this is learning task. So you would, you would you use both of them. And uh, uh, I, I guess it's possible to use, uh, to, to use uh, games even in assessments. And you, you can have applications using that. Uh, uh, they, they test you, so many, so many application facts, online applications, they test you or test the kids uh, uh, about their math, about their science, just using sort of uh, games rather than uh, simply uh, asking uh, direct scientific questions or uh, could also be applied to language. They, uh, it, it could be, uh, wait, wait, wait. I, I think most uh, uh, primary school textbooks, okay, they have, uh, an accompanying CD or DVD that they use games or um, stories where they reinforce learning through games. It's possible to test. Yes. Okay, thank you so much for your feedback. Uh, right, we have another question for you from uh, uh, Shuaib Yemeni. Uh, how could we adapt games in a 30 or 40 students class and make them beneficial and fun rather than a noisy task. Crowd. Ah, noisy task. Yeah, <clears throat> if, if, you, uh, if you reject the idea that group work is very interesting, so you would automatically reject the idea of implementing games, uh, I guess. But if you accept that uh, you, could, you could divide your students into groups, even if you have a class of 35, then you can think of uh, games that you can use in groups. For example, groups of five or groups of six, you would find different, perhaps you're not supposed to give the same, the same, uh, the same, you, you could, uh, you could, uh, you could uh, perhaps use the, the games that would uh, be, uh, that would match your environment, that would be possible in your environment if you have 35 students. And you could also use, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, video projector, you can project on, on, on the wall and then you, you, you can have a lot of interaction in the class. Not necessarily, uh, this could not be a, a handicap if you have a large class. I guess it's, it's possible you can use the video projector and use games with your class. And we have seen some teachers doing that in demonstration classes, lessons. Okay, uh, we have another question from Pakistan, uh, from Al Fakir, uh, from Steward Jafar Rao. Yeah. Uh, uh, the question is What if students do not want to participate in games? How to encourage them to participate? It, it's a it's question of uh, culture, perhaps. It's a question of culture. By culture, uh, I mean, uh, if, for example, uh, uh, students uh, uh, learn how to, 
to learn by using games from the primary school, okay, it, it would not be, uh, even if they have not been exposed to an environment where there's a lot of play in the primary school, when they come, you look for games that would not, for example, hurt their cultural values. You, you look for appropriate games that would not uh, uh, shock their, uh, their way of thinking. So there are games that, that not necessarily, uh, I mean, uh, uh, do not uh, uh, do not uh, scratch the feelings of uh, of students. You can use games because they are learning. Okay, that's that, that's the purpose. It's not ga the game itself, but the the point is to learn through games. But sometimes we have to learn without games. I agree. Okay, good point in that, sir. Uh, one last question for you. Uh, are, uh, are our teaching environments suitable for gaming learning? So this is a question asked uh, by or, Sorry? Are, uh, are our teaching environments suitable for gaming learning or game learning? Uh, I think we have uh, one, uh, one, uh, one thing that would impede uh, okay, uh, the implementation, and I mentioned that in the paper, which is related to uh, the textbook do not provide uh, uh, games, uh, do not provide games for teachers, or they don't even leave space for that in, in the program. So this is one, uh, but uh, I know so the, the, given the expertise of some teachers, it's, it's very easy uh, to, to, to use the textbook and reinforce uh, that immediately with a game or use a game to introduce the, the teaching points you have in the textbook. So when you mix things, you would realize that those that you have uh, used it through the games uh, have been retained much better than the ones that, uh, are, uh, the, that are mentioned or that are parts of the textbook. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible uh, to, to, to use them the, despite the environments. We don't have to blame the, the environment all the time, but we can do things as teachers. We can. Uh, we can um, we can uh, we can uh, meet the challenge every time we, we try. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, of course, uh, there are many questions, but uh, we're going to try to address those questions at the end uh, in a discussion okay. section. Uh, all right, so we move to the next uh, uh, presentation, which will be uh, presented by all right, George, Mr. George Cocolas. Uh, the topic of the presentation is gamification and practical application for AF learners. But please allow me to introduce uh, our guest speaker, Mrs. George uh, Korakas. Uh, George uh, Kokolas has been working in, as the academic director, director and teacher trainer uh, for Express Publishing for the last 20 years. He's a certified level five TEFL teacher and a certified advanced uh, neuro language coach practicing uh, and neuro language coaching professionally. Right after his graduation, he branched out from his major in English literature and devoted himself to fully to ALT. He likes to be considered a frontline teacher spending many hours inside the classroom teaching and learning at the same time. His vast experience has been of considerable help in developing helpful and practical views about topics of ALT methodology. So for like motivation, effective learning, technology in the classroom, cr critical thinking, differentiated instruction, and of course, uh, neural language coaching. So he has delivered uh, a bench of seminars and conferences throughout the world. Okay, uh, the floor is yours, Mr. George, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me um, share my screen, try to share my screen so we can start this presentation and take advantage of my 20 minutes as well. Okay, hope yeah. that you can all see this. Um, first of all, a, a very big thanks uh, for the invitation. A very warm welcome uh, from Athens. You know, it's quarter to 10 right now at night. Very warm night, 37 degrees outside. It's, it's really hot here. But uh, I'm really happy that uh, we are here to share and learn some few things, irrespective of the weather that we have outside. And I'm also very happy because I haven't met any of the 
uh, these excellent professionals in the panel before, but apparently so far we are not overlapping. On the contrary, I think that we are somehow supplementing the one the other. And um, uh, really big thanks to Mr. Um, Sadud for mentioning video games because um, this is one of the main aspects that I want to talk about uh, today. Um, something that I would like to clarify since the beginning. Um, when I was invited, I said to Mr. Caseras, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I can talk about games, but I can talk about gamification, which is something um, a little bit different. And when I'm talking about gamification, if we want to define this, I'm going to provide a definition, but nef definitely it's not only about playing games. Gamification is mostly applying game-like techniques, techniques that can be found in games to our everyday classes. And why doing this? So to achieve motivation. There is, um, uh, how can I say, a development of this idea. It didn't start from education. However, it was absorbed by education. And historically, I can prove this to you. And of course, today we will try to see how we can have a practical application after trying to explain a little bit of theory. So let's get started. Now, I would um, obviously cannot interact, but um, I don't know if these two pictures look to you familiar. In the first one, we have reluctancy, the epitome of reluctancy. A, a girl who uh, looks at the books, doesn't want to study, but the very same girl, when he puts, he's put in front of the computer with maybe his brother or a classmate, um, completely and suddenly the whole perspective changes. Let's keep this picture in mind. I'm sure most of you who are parents or who are teachers as well, today we are talking about a new hybrid of students who are called the millennials. And it's not me who are here to rediscover America. We are talking about a huge bibliography. It all started by Mark Prensky. He talked about gaming, about video games, and how this can literally affect the brain of today's kids. Let me put it this way, so simple, because this is another um, very long talk. The kids that we have in our classes today, just because of all this interaction with technology, they have a completely different thinking than we have. And this can be explained when we try to become more specific and talk about video games. And I'm sure if you pay attention to this picture and try to answer this question, which of these pictures reflects reality, you would definitely say picture B because you have come across, or maybe you have been present in a similar situation where the, the kids are not literally engaged, simply engaged in front of the screen playing a game. They are literally glued inside the screen. And uh, there must be something there to this pattern. I don't want to be misunderstood. No addiction is right. And I do know, I have many cases even in my proper environment where uh, vid playing video games becomes an addiction, but I want to focus on a specific pattern here, engagement, motivation that has been scientifically proved right now that can definitely put in another dimension and it can be used for didactic purposes as well. Um, uh, there is so much about um, video gaming, but I would like to become more uh, specific by trying to explain why video games can be very exciting. First of all, and I'm going to correlate this later on with other um, uh, ideas, we're talking about puzzles with lower stakes. No one is hurt here. When you're playing a game, you have nothing to risk. No matter if you fail several times, no matter if you try, try again and again to achieve something, there is no punishment. There are no consequences. And what does this mean? It means, as uh, Mr. Sadud uh, said before, that your affective filters are lowered. You are more relaxed. You are more receptive to knowledge. You are more open to new things when you play a video game. So um, um, uh, instinctively, your, your brain uh, becomes more willing to learn. They are very engaging, and I have, I have a theory later on that I'm going to indicate to you, and I'm going to try to explain why this is happening. But definitely, I'm sure we all have in our proper environment someone who is uh, playing several 
uh, hours in front of the computer, being engaged, even forgetting that he's spending maybe three or four hours doing this. Some people call it an addiction as well, but I call it partially engagement. Interactive and interactivity. This is a very big buzzing word regarding technology. iPhone, iBook, i this, i that, they all stand for interactive. It all stands for interactivity. Meaning what? That if I decide to apply this to education, I need not to forget that I'm talking about the pattern that I'm pressing a button and I receive a response. I'm pressing the screen and something is happening. This is a very engaging pattern. And when we are talking about excitement, this is definitely what gets our brains excited. And this is totally connected with the next point because I don't know if you have read another great uh, person who has written about the brain, highly recommended by Mr. David Souza or Souza. And he has defined the three passions of the brain, which it happened to be um, actually proved by so many other people later on. And he talked that we all have three passions in our brain. Number one is survival. That is why we get into a fight or a flight mode when we feel threatened. This comes back from the Serengeti period when we try to survive, but it's natural in here. The second passion that we have is um, novelty, which means that we are excited by anything new that we see. Our brain is born with this specific function. Actually, there is a specific code that I love. Learning for the brain is as natural as breathing, which means that the opportunity for something new is always there. And the third is happiness. This is our uh, other need. We are built by nature to seek pleasure and not disappointment. And of course, video games put us in a state of flow. And here I'm going to quote from another man that I'm sure you know, Mr. Mikhalik Csikszentmihalyi. Mihali. He has worked a lot with Mr. Kras, and as was mentioned also before, he's not necessarily very much into education, and he has come up with the idea of the flow. Now, if I'm to explain it very, very simply, you get into a state of flow when, for example, you read a book and you are so absorbed by it that you totally disconnect with the world around you for a certain milliseconds. This is exactly what is happening when you're playing a game. You are so absorbed, you are so excited, your brain is so much up to it that you know, you're getting into a state of flow. I would love to have the same psychological state in my classes. And as Mr. Tixas Mihali says, uh, this is actually achieved when you have the two opposites. You have apathy, you have the flow, and you have these contradictory challenges and skills, worry, boredom, anxiety, relax, arousal, control. If you manage to maintain your students' interest somewhere here in the middle, interchanging in between uh, these contradictory feelings, then flow can be achieved. I'm not saying that it's easy, but all I'm saying is that it can happen. And those of you who are not convinced, let me give you simply some uh, numbers. I don't know if you're familiar with this game Farmville. I used to suffer from an addiction regarding this game. It used to be on Facebook. We are talking about 28 million users on a daily basis. They play Farmville. It's like having a digital garden, um, seeding oranges, lettuces, carrots, and then you collect them and you collect points. Or the World of Warcraft that has 5 million people play over 40 hours a week. So there must be a pattern there that we need to have a look at. And as I said before, gamification, it's not about only playing games. It's about the concept of applying game mechanics and game design techniques to engage and motivate people to achieve their goals. And in our case, this goal should be learning. I mentioned before that this is not about, it didn't start from education. It's a marketing business concept. Those of you who have um, an affiliation card from a supermarket or a gas station, this is exactly what you are doing. You are being gamified maybe without knowing because you are intrigued to consume more and more. So to acquire points and um, somehow you know achieve some presence. It's the reward that makes the engagement. And I don't have 
time to play this video, but I highly, highly recommend that you go and you read about Mr. Robert Sapolsky. He has an amazing long title. He's a neuroendocrinologist, biologist. He's a, a professor of a very highly rank. And there is this video, which is called Dopamine Jackpot. And this man, uh, he makes a lot of experience with primates, bamboos, chimpanzees, macacas, and he proved scientifically that what really creates this excitement, what really makes our dopamine go high, dopamine is about excitement when we are very happy, is not necessarily the reward, but the anticipation of the reward. So I play, I play again and again. I maybe want to learn more and more because I expect that I'm going to win something. And if we create this carrot, if we create this motivation, maybe, maybe we can hope that our students will be more motivated. Um, very, very soon, gamification started becoming part of education as well. And of course, the first thing started when more students started reporting and describing a class as a boring place. And it was then when people came, um, uh, came across and invented teachers, the report cards, but they are not enough to motivate uh, the school uh, task in general. I would call them for today's kids very obsolete, or uh, some uh, teachers, they even practice it. Uh, they offer, especially at primary learners, stickers or chocolates or even candy. There is some kind of reward uh, behind the task, so to motivate the kids, that were pure gamification elements there. Um, if you do the task that I'm assigning, then you can uh, warn a prize or a new rule or different emotions and roles. But if we were to see much closer how we can benefit from gamification and education, I can totally tell you that it motivates the students to play and use certain game-like elements in a non-game situation. For me, number two is very important, reinforcement of self-directed learning. Now, imagine that you have your kid or a friend's kid and receives a box with a computer or a PlayStation. Do these kids, before they unbox this device, do they ever read the prospectus? Do they ever read the manuals? Do they ever read the guidelines? No. They are self-directed, they open the box, and they um, put together uh, all, set up, do all the setup of this device alone, without the use of the teacher. This is exactly what we're having here. We have such a high motivation level that the kid gradually starts not needing the teacher. I'm always there. I monitor, I facilitate. But if I see my students doing something alone, I totally encourage them because this is the absolute self-directed learning. I don't know if you are familiar with Angry Birds. I'm sure you are. And that's another very popular game. But this is a game that I'm mentioning here because you can see also the cognitive benefits of gamification. Why? Because you need to adjust. You need to recognize the system and the rule in order to explore, experiment, learn from the result, a lot of trial and error, and then become a winner. You need to adjust your finger so to um, demolish and deconstruct this tower. And this means a lot of adaptability and progression of cognitive skills. And of course, it's all about emotion my friends, uh, because failing in a game uh, leads to knowledge of specific things to do or not to do. So the next time the students will be successful, we all learn through our errors. I cannot demonize that. This is a human approach. If I make it um, a global perspective in my classroom and through a gamification state, when I have a second or a third and a fourth opportunity, when there is no risk at all, this creates again a more relaxing environment where learning becomes more receptive and eventually they reach the desired score. And if you uh, we, we said in the beginning that we we're going to talk a little bit about history. The first gamified application, my friends, was in Harry Potter. 
that was exactly what was happening in Hogwarts. They were divided into four different clans in the beginning of each book or each movie. There were some tasks that they were setting up and these teams, they were interacting in connection to their syllabi, to the um, program of the school. So that was not like simply playing a game. Uh, that was about, about competing uh, regarding the tasks of the school curriculum. And that's where you have the development of the social skills. Because when I have four different clans, it's then when the students realize that they have to take up one for the team, uh, to have their own identities and responsibilities, and that their actions affect the rest of the team. Perfect application there through education. Now, some elements that speed up the learning process, score points, badges, leaderboards that you want to use, any of them can definitely um, uh, spice up with some gamification your classes. You need to have a player control, which means that everything has to be very clear since the beginning. I know that this question has come up, uh, has popped up several times. And Mrs. Rogers also replied to that. And Mr. Hazud, Hazud uh, uh, it has to be everything very clear. That's the first rule when I play a game. And that's my first rule that this is not going to fail. I should be the one who had played this game many times before I apply it in a classroom. So I must be in control of the player and the game itself. Mastery and leveling up opportunities. Imagine yourself attending a class and after four or five years of, let's say, English, not being able to communicate not being able to know or form a single phrase, a phrase, you realize how disappointing this might be. So gamification gives me this opportunity to show to my students, to my, that my students show to me that they know and that they have achieved mastery. My goals and indicators should be very clear since the beginning if I want this to uh, be a successful process. Immediate feedback. The millennials cannot wait, my friends. I have mentioned it in so many talks all over the world. They need to know now. I have finished the task. I have finished the exercise. I have given you the composition. I want to know if I failed or if I need to give it another go. Because this is exactly what they are used to from all the video games. And of course, collaboration opportunities, as I mentioned before regarding the team, which is one of the clear 21st century skills. If you divide your classroom into two, three, four different clans, if you set up the clear rules, uh, if you set up a reward, voila, you may have a clear gamification. And this is exactly as a recap, as almost the final slide, create an achievement system, create a level system, so mastery can be very clear that from A you go to B, that you B from go to C, and so on and so forth. You can create the teams, you can create the quest and challenges, but also with this, always with a syllabus directed objective. I'm not talking about simply running up and down the classroom playing with no objective. This is another special rule for any game to be succeeded. There must be an objective and there must be a meaning. Create awards and badges and um, anything else, you know, that uh, you feel that motivates your classroom. Make the progress visible, provide instant feedback. Alternative versions of tests, yes, you can test through games, but games is not about testing, it's about assessment. I can receive so much valuable feedback when the brains of my students are relaxed, when they play a game, everything is incidental. Everything is happening there in a more relaxing mode and I can receive more precious feedback, which is very precious for their evaluation and progress because I may need to amend or rectify things in my syllabus so to achieve more progress. Allow not only second chances, third, fourth chances uh, until your students get it. You know, all the brains of the people are wired differently. This is what neuroscience says right now. I'm very glad that it was mentioned, the um, BDNF factor. Actually, it, it, it's pushed a lot by a lot of exercise and a lot of movement. So every time I feel that my students need to stress a little bit, stretch a little bit, that's what I do. I, I give them the opportunity to get up, move a little bit, 
oxygen gets in the brain and of course the BDNF factor is also um, um, improved. And of course, embrace failure, emphasize practice, implement educational technology and turn study into a game. And if you want a recommendation, you know, the only gamified platform that I have seen right now that really works comes from Express Publishing and it's Digibooks. These are the only guys who have actually made this a reality. You can create a class, but at the same time, you can have um, a total Harry Potter school there. That's the only platform that I have seen this implemented. And in case you want to have some extra feedback or you may have some questions, if you want to um, uh, put in contact with me, this is my mail. You can follow me. I'm in every possible social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, also, we have a Teacher's Coffee. It's a podcast, but a very famous uh, Facebook page with a lot of interesting uh, articles every single day. And of course, there's a brand new page called ELT Action, which uh, you can definitely follow. Uh, we try to connect teachers from all over the world, make it an international hub. Uh, it's all about development. It's all about sharing. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy that through maybe these websites and through these presentations that I was here with you today. It was again through sharing. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. George Kokolas, for uh, this insightful and rich uh, presentation. Uh, uh, actually, I have picked uh, picked up uh, some questions for you, and thank you for uh, thank you for displaying your email so that people can can ask you multiple questions and that you can uh, uh, respond to accordingly. So, my question here, I have a question from Abdul Zak uh, Shtien. Games affect the memory area. May you please suggest guidelines for this issue? Well, um, a memory is a very tricky thing. It's, it's something that, you know, it's, uh, first of all, it's very, very complicated mechanism uh, that takes place into our brain. I would say if I have, I don't know if the question is if I agree or disagree. I think that this can be an extra practice as well for the memory. But hey, there is no guarantees here. I mean, what might be very favorable for you regarding your memory might not be for me without implying that there is going to be any problem, uh, physiological problem here. Uh, so, yeah, I would say yes, yes, definitely they can be a context where maybe memory can be improved. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Jafar Rao. Uh, if a game becomes addiction to mm -hmm. a student, is it, is it right to ban the game for kid or there's another solution? Um, well, uh, banning is, um, is a little bit, you know, a tough selection, but, you know, this is a topic that has to do a lot with psychology, school psychology. Usually I would address this problem and try to find the root of the problem. Usually we're having an addiction when, when we don't have any other interests. What is the remedy to addiction? Balance. So if you have, because I had several cases where the kids were literally in front of the screen for seven or eight hours, this means that they are lack, lacking other interests. And it's up to me as a parent and as a teacher to provide these stimuli, these different interests, give them this trial and error period. Um, uh, if you know you don't spend any time with your kid or with your student or you don't offer these opportunities, something that he can actually leave the house, maybe practice a sport or any other interest, then eventually it's very tempting to have a computer and a PlayStation or any other game console there. Uh, we need to provide alternatives and without implementing any strict or uh, non-allowing things, I think we can remove them from this addiction state. Okay, uh, we have another question from uh, Sibel Baytur Cizir from Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any course books based on gamification yet? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about this. There's a lot of supplementary materials that you can get. Some of them were mentioned from the previous speakers, many resources uh, on the internet as well. The only material that I have seen organized in a digital platform is um, uh, Digibooks from uh, Express Publishing, but a course book per se to be gamified, um, I haven't come across anything yet, like a complete method. 
Okay, thank you for the reaction. Uh, one, one more, one more question, please. Uh, With pleasure. Uh, from Abd Kibir Sukhtani. Uh, to what extent gamification could improve shy and low achievers uh, learners level? Oh, it can have amazing improvement because of what I mentioned before. It's a very relaxing state of flow. It's a very relaxing state of learning. You sell it to them like they, we're going to play a game. So eventually, if they see, and I'm going to totally agree with the previous speakers, I think it was exactly the same conclusion. We must be serious about playing games we need to fully integrate it into our syllabus. They have to become and be established as language routines. So I'm not talking about playing a game every once a month. I'm talking about something which is fully integrated into my syllabus. I know it inside out. I know how to implement it. I practice it very frequently. The message is automatically conveyed. So even the SAI students, if they follow this routine and they see that I'm very serious about it, they will become very serious about it. And I think they will are going to overcome their sinus. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Joseph Kokolas. Always a pleasure, thank you. Okay, uh, now, uh, Habiba uh, Dewi, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, um, I guess it's my turn, then we move oh. to Habiba, yeah? Okay, all Maybe right. She's, yeah. She's, okay, uh, so uh, uh, the next uh, presentation is going to be about uh, uh, top tips uh, to using games in EFL classroom, uh, which will be presented by Mr. Hussein uh, Qasiras. Uh, Hussein Qasiras is a certified EFL teacher from Kenitra, Morocco. He has been teaching for um, more than 12 years, graduating from Ines Rabat. He has got the privilege to teach in uh, uh, prestigious uh, institutions, and also uh, he has got a chance to uh, teach English business and marketing in, uh, uh, at, at Standard University, Hassan the Second Institute of Agronomy and Veterinary Sciences, uh, at Muhammadiyah School of Engineers and the National School of the Mineral Industry. Uh, Al Hussein has, gone, uh, has got two masters, a uh, Master of Business Administration in Project Management from Cardiff Metropolitan University, UK and a Master of Education from Mohammed V University in Rabat. So uh, Hussein is also, the, he's the project uh, manager of Global Bus Foundation, as he uh, also, he has already managed two projects within the, the program, Yes Peace Project and Youth Empowerment, uh, Youth Empowerment Project. He's a teacher trainer and several program coordinator at Tikoso Academy in Rabat. And he has participated in multiple international conferences on TESOL and on youth empowerment and in education. He has coached and uh, trained youth and teachers, future teachers in Morocco, Tunisia, and Spain. Uh, his major interests are project management, global education, peace building, and TESOL and TEFL. Thank you so much, Mr. Qasiras. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Um, thanks a lot, our moderator, Mr. Ali Biku. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank our international guest speakers. Um, we really um, uh, have learned a lot from your presentations, and this is the positive effects of coronavirus. It gathers us all here, and it's uh, really a great opportunity to learn from each other and the audience of who are learning right now. So every problem has got both positive and negative, of course. So coronavirus has got a lot of problems, but hopefully I can see Rogers, I guess in Thailand, yeah, or Vietnam, he's safe. Um, George in, in Greece, he's right safe. Mr. Shadoudi in, in Saleh, Morocco, he's safe, okay. Habib in Algeria, Ali Buku here in Saleh. So that's really great about coronavirus because we all the time talk only about something negative about it. Hopefully we are learning from each other. Good. So I really um, uh, noticed something very important, what our uh, international speakers have talked about. They all talked about something very important, which is uh, when using games, there are two, fun and learning. These are very important elements, yes. We don't use games for fun. We don't use games for just learning, but we use games for fun plus 
learning. And my presentation, let me first uh, share the screen. Okay, my presentation will be about some top tips. Uh, okay, can you see? Yes, can you yes. just post it in the diaporama? All right, it's clear now? Yes. All right, just one second, thank you. It's okay. okay. Good, so top tips for using games in EFL or ESL classrooms, okay. So this is the presentation objectives, introduction, then we will move to some top tips for using games in the classroom, then uh, tools to promote the use of games in the classroom, and there is a, a conclusion at the end. All right, so the first tip, let's start with why, because we have got a lot of games in mind, okay. But the most important is why and the why stands for your purpose, for your educational objectives. Where are you going to use this game exactly? And these are some objectives. Is it for building interest? Because some games can be used only for building interest or for presenting, like creating the contact, or for reviewing. Once you finish the lesson, you review using a game, okay? Or there are other questions we have to ask. Is it uh, for the right group age you are teaching? Um, uh, young learners, teenagers, adults. Some games can be adapted to all ages, but other games, no, it depends on a certain age. And of course, for the right level of, uh, or the right level proficiency, then we have for the right number of students. Are you going to teach small classes or large classes or very, very large class, like 100%, sorry, 100 students. I still remember when I, um, when I went to Tunisia training some young people, I used a game with more than 76 students. So 76 is a large number, but not all the all games can be used with, the, with that number of, of students. So this is a very important element or point for the right number of students. Then for the right length of time, some uh, audience ask questions about um, uh, uh, the exact time for playing games, but it depends on the type of the lesson, the type of the game, and even the, the size of the classroom, etc. And uh, the last one is, of course, for the right content. So this is the, the why. Um, the, when you are using a game, number one, what are your objectives? Exactly, okay. And here I'm going to use a, a certain game, okay. And uh, basically, when I use this picture with my learners, they get um, a lot of fun. Okay. So for Rogers and yours, what is this? Yeah. Typical Moroccan dish. Very good. Moroccan dish. Yeah. So what what's the, the name? I know I have tasted, but I cannot remember the name. <laughs> good. Rogers, have you ever seen... This dish, can you hear me, Roger? Yeah, she can't hear me. All right, good. So, Mr. Shadudi, yeah, he's gonna give you the right answer, of course. So, what do you think? It's Friday couscous. <laughs> yeah, so you added Friday, the time, exactly. So basically we eat couscous on Friday. So why I'm using this game? So um, um, uh, George, you know that there is, um, um, the game's name is um, Star Game or Cloud Game. But here I adapt it and I give it the name of couscous to, um, for the Moroccan culture, okay. So here, when Moroccan, when, when, when tourists come to Morocco, the first dish that we serve them is couscous. And then we sit together like a circle here and we start talking, eating and talking. For example, um, uh, George, when you come to Morocco, okay, and you are most welcome, I'm gonna serve you the first dish, which is couscous. So we sit together with the family and then we ask questions, where are you from? What do you do? What's your favorite food? Something like that, it's a kind of discussion, a kind of communication, okay. And here we have five vegetables. The, the, the typical couscous is with uh, seven vegetables. And this is the game of today, okay. So here, this is couscous game. How many words? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven words, seven vegetables, 
stands for seven words about me. For example, the first time I'm, gonna, I'm going to meet my learners, my students, I'm not going to introduce myself traditionally using I am, I am, I am, okay? But it's gonna be a, a kind of interaction between me and the audience. So my learners are going to ask questions and the answers are there. And of course, if I'm teaching um, children or beginners, I'm going to use only colors like blue or uh, name of food like pizza or numbers. If, uh, if I'm teaching advanced learners, I'm gonna uh, use some difficult words. So here blue, they may ask, what's your favorite blue? I say, very good job. My favorite, uh, sorry, my favorite color is blue. Um, pizza, what do you think? Pizza, what's your favorite food? Very good, it's pizza. Soccer, your favorite um, sport, it's soccer. Four, how many, um, or how, uh, yeah, how many brothers and sisters? I have got four. Hussein, what's your name? So as you see here, there is an interaction. This is, we start with the why. When you are using the game, what purpose? So the purpose, this, this is the purpose. I'm going to meet my learners the first time. So I'm going to use a certain game. It's a kind of interaction between me and the audience. Once they finish, I'm going to give them some piece piece of paper and they have to draw a circle like Qsariya. Qsariya in, uh, in English means the, um, it's like a tra tra traditional dish used for, um, for couscous, okay. They are going to write seven words about themselves. Then they introduce, ask and answer. So this is couscous game. Next, now the second tip. Tip is that we have to meet internet generations expectations. So we are teaching learners that belong to internet generation, which means that once they opened their eyes, they found internet, they found WhatsApp, they found um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So we have to include, we have to integrate ICT. We have to integrate online games in our classes. Now it's, 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 it's good to include board games, but it's very essential to use, to use online games. And these are some examples of online games that we can use like Kahoot game. And I guess all, all, we all know about this game. Millionaires, quizzes, uh, bamboozle, class dojo, and fluent you. Okay, so these are some online games uh, because of um, the time constraints. I'm not going to use all of them, but I'm going to, to um, share with you bamboozle just to have an idea about it. So let me just um, share it. Sorry, just one second. To the website. Okay, so do you see? Yes, sir. Is it clear here? Okay. Yes, please. Oh, good. So this is the www.bamboozle.com. I can use Kahoot or Bamboozle, but now when I want to review with my learners, Okay, for example, vocabulary words is one of the best online games you can use with the internet generation. So here we have teams. Let's have, for example, four teams. Okay, and then you have options. So options, second per question off, pass bot off, I'm gonna make it off. Color, colorful grid on, for example. Wrong answer, if you get the wrong answer, lose points. Okay, so let's, uh, classic, let's start here. This is just an example. So here are going to have four teams. So we have Shududi, number one. We have uh, George, number two. Um, Rogers, number three. And Habiba, number four. Habiba or uh, Ali, okay. So please, um, uh, Mr. Shududi, can you choose num from one to eight? Just number, choose number one number from one to eight. From one to eight? Yeah, choose only one number. Uh, including the two and three and four, yes? Yeah, all of them, yeah, just one number, yeah. Okay, I choose two, okay. Two, okay, so number two. Oh, oh you are lucky. From the very beginning, you won 25 points. You are so lucky. Okay, so Mr. Shududi team number one got 25. Now, number two, George, can you choose from these numbers? Choose only one. Can you unmute yourself, George, so you can speak? Number eight. I'm number going for number eight. eight. Okay, so number eight, what, which country was the first to declare the U.S. independence? Is it England, France, 
Morocco or Greece? What do you think? I know that Greece is impossible to be. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I will I will go for mm, France, maybe. France. Oh, let me see. Uh, incorrect. It's Morocco. Really? Okay. Yeah, I didn't that, know that. That's it's new information. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Now, Rogers, can you choose from these numbers? Five. Roger, five. All right. So, which country is closer to Greece? Turkey, Morocco, Algeria, or USA? Turkey. So, let's see. Very good job. Okay, so you got... Oh, so do the 25, Rogers, 25. Now, Habiba and Ali, which number? Uh, uh, six. 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 All right, so let's see. Uh, what is the, the most famous city or town in Morocco? Marrakesh, Rabat, Marrakech. Casablanca, or Zhiliga? Marrakesh. Marrakesh. Casablanca or Marrakesh? Marrakesh, Habiba. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Ali said Marrakesh. Very good job. Yes. <laughs> please go back to Mr. Shadoudi. Yes, please. Very quickly. Uh -huh. Which number? Uh, another seven. number. Seven. Seven. All right. So, what is the biggest country? USA, Algeria, Morocco, or Greece? USA. Very, very easy. Okay, <laughs> that's yeah. interesting. The next one. Yes, please. George. Number yeah, four, you, sorry, number four. Number four. So what colors does, does the Algerian flag have? Green and oh, red, or green and white, or green, red, and white? Algeria is difficult for you. Oh, my God. Uh, you no, can no, I, I, Habiba to help you. Habiba, you know? Yes, All right. green, yes. Yes, green red, and white. Rogers, can you? Do you know? I, I think you don't know, you can ask white. for help. Green, red, and white. Okay, so, green, red, and white. <laughs> green, red, and white. Very good. All right. What's this? Zero. Come yeah, on. Yeah, I was minus Zero 15. That's why. I was minus 15. Minus 15. Yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, Rogers. <laughs> Number three, please. Number three. So, what is the capital of Greece? Uh, Rabat. What do you think? So, uh, George can help you if you want. <laughs> I think I got this one, Athens. Well, man, All right. on, of course. <laughs> All right. It's it's easy. It's Very good. good. The last group. Habiba. Uh, we, are, we are left with one. 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 So, what is the biggest country? Morocco, Algeria, Greece, or USA? USA. A. All right. Good. Very this engaging. Who is the winner? The winner is Mr. Shadoudi, I guess. No, no, no. Yes. Team three. Mr. Shadoudi, very good job. No, no, not me, yes. not me. So this is a game. All of us. Oh, sorry, All it's, uh, it's... All of us. It's Rogers, a, 45. Five. Five. Rogers. It's, it's Brianna, it's Brianna who won. <laughs> yeah, Brianna Rogers. Definitely. All right, thank you. Yeah. So as you see, online games motivate engage students a lot because they belong to internet generation. All right, it's so just an example. Good. Um, let me go back again to my slides. Here, um, we said number two, as a tip, meet internet generation expectations. Use online games. They are very important in EPL and EC classes. Next. Yeah, so as, a, as you say here, as you see here, Bamboo, uh, Bamboozle is an online game used, number one, as a warmer, warm-up activities, or as a concept checker, chicken, chicken understanding, or at the end, you review um, the lesson. Now, tip number three, make your classroom management a game. When we use games, there is motivation, there is competition. Yes. Sometimes there is noise, and sometimes students cannot stop. They are over and over active, over motivated, and then there is disorder, confusion, chaos. Now, make your classroom a game. How? For example, here, using web-based platform for classroom management. Instead of uh, um, talking to students in class, you can um, postpone that after, once they go home and then you, co you connect. 
and you send them the, the feedback uh, online. For example, here, we use tools like Class Juju. It's an online behavior management system to maintain positive behavior fun and to help students reach their behavior goals by getting physical rewards. You can send them some physical rewards to help them improve their behavior. To allow, which is very important, parents to monitor their children's behavior. When we are trying to um, improve our learners' behavior, especially uh, discipline problems, the teacher sometimes cannot resolve this issue. So the best is to include parents in the process of helping and improving students' behavior in class. To help parents communicate with their children and teachers. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, to show you this, this um, online um, game. Just one second again, please. All right. So here we go. So this is um, uh, teach.classdoos.com. This is Mr. Kathira's class, this is my class. So now I'm, I'm at home. I finished the game with my students in class. And some students um, create a lot of troubles, but some students were on task, were motivated, and they participate. So here, for example, I'm gonna choose Kautar. Okay, so this is Kautar in my class. I'm gonna say, ah, oh, participating very well. So plus one. Okay, so Kautar is gonna re receive plus one. This is physical reward. It's gonna help improve the, the, I mean, the classroom management, okay, the behavior of students. Here, I'm gonna go to Sad. Maybe Sad was not good, okay. He did not do well. Maybe he made a lot of, um, or he creates troubles in my class, okay. So I'm gonna write, just one second, sorry. Here, I'm gonna say, for example, concentrate very well and send it to him or her. These are just some examples, okay? And what is the importance of class dojo is that parents can see everything. So both the teacher and parents can help the students to get improved. It's very important and it works a lot for me because sometimes as a teacher, you cannot solve the problem or you can address the whole class. You can say um, here, for example, you were working very well, you were great and you sent, you sent plus one for working hard to the whole class. Students like it a lot. They like the physical reward. Okay, good. Because of um, time constraints, I'm not going to go deeper in this one, but this is one of the best tools that can help when you, when you deal with classroom management. All right, next. So tip number four, Tip number four is getting feedback from learners. Now, when we talk about the job market, the king of the job market or the queen is the customer. When we talk about education, the, the queen and the king is the learner. So we, if we want, if, um, I mean, uh, as teachers, if we want to improve our teaching styles, we have to get some feedback from learners. So when you play a game, it's very important to ask your learners these questions, what they like, what they don't like, how did you find the game, etc. So when the game is over, it's very helpful to get feedback from learners to know about what? About their needs, their wants, interests, likes, dislikes, and attitudes. It's a kind of need analysis. We cannot get improved unless we know about the needs and wants of our learners. So here I use another online platform. I'm gonna show it to you again. One second. So this is the, uh, uh, I guess some of you know about it. it's poll everywhere, it's for voting. So for example, when I finish, let me just make it full screen. When I finish, I ask my learners, 
what is your favorite online game in EFA classes? These, these are some questions. Okay. Now, for the audience, please, can you respond here? You have respond at poleve.com slash Hussein Kaz 057. Please, I'm going to give you one second. Okay, one minute. Can you please vote just to show you? And students like it a lot. They see, and, and then you know about your class. What do they like? Do they like online games or offline games or um, board games, etc.? And here we have what is your favorite online game in EFA classes? Number one, Kahoot, Bamboozle, Millionaire, Class Dojo, etc. Can you please, uh, um, here you can type poleeve.com slash Hussein class um, 057. And then you can vote. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna wait for your um, answers. Yes, please. So I don't want to waste a lot of time. How much time? Yeah, uh, very quickly. Yeah, we can see very quickly. Just, just uh, vote. Choose is it A, B, C, or D. One. All right. So can, can you can you write that to me? Can you paste it in the uh, in the chat box and then I can. No, no. They, they, we can see. We can see their vote here on the screen. Yeah. Can so, can anyone? Okay, or they can write in the chat box. That's Good, this is, this is the uh, question. Then there is another question, for example, when you finish with your learners, there's another question that you can ask, when do you like to play games in the classroom? Okay, before or in the middle of the session or after or before and after the lesson. So when you use this uh, online platform, students like it a lot and they see the result at the end and also uh, as a teacher you know what is good for your learners what they like and what they don't like yeah i, I really um, use this many times with my learners and it worked effectively and students knew about the whole class interests etc okay yeah another question for example here when we finish the game is what what don't you like about games in in EP classroom so you don't like what noise competition consuming much time or you don't like fun and then they choose is it a b and c based on that the teacher will have um, a general uh, picture about his class and then you can improve your teaching uh, styles when using certain games okay all right good the next one Yeah, so this is the, the using a poll everywhere to get feedback from learners because it's part of learning when we get feedback from our um, students. Now, uh, at the conclusion, games are great tools to use in EFL and EC classroom. They are great. Why? Yeah, as Mr. Shadudi, um, George Rogers um, have mentioned, they motivate, they engage. It's teamwork, team building, collaboration. It's a memorable learning for students. And also to break the routine, it's a welcome break. But this is very important. Games should promote the teacher's teaching style and not replace it. So don't use the game as a whole and the game will provide the instructions and everything, no. The game is used only as a tool for motivating learners, but the teacher should add something in that game. This is the most important thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sir Hussein. Yeah, most welcome. Okay, thank you, Sir Hussein. Thank you very much for uh, this. Very short presentation. Yeah, but it's effective, right? Good, all right, so let's uh, swift, swift, uh, let's uh, move swiftly on to the questions. I have some questions here for you, Mr. Kassiras. Uh, Right. Okay. So this question is from uh, Jamel from Algeria. Uh, what do you think about using word search games? And is there some techniques how to use this kind of, of games? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so um, it's a kind of puzzle, okay. Search um, word games. 
uh, basically, um, there are many websites. We can, you can find um, very available games, okay, there. But if you want to, um, to prepare by yourself, it's time consuming, it takes time. Okay, so my piece of advice is just to try to find them on, on the website and search um, where games are very important uh, because they, they really help students to be creative and to, um, to think um, um, a lot about the, the certain meaning of, of words. But here, the most important thing about using games can be um, search word game or puzzles in general or um, race game, etc. The most important when you are using that game is what are your objectives. If you do not identify your objectives, you will kill the game and you will kill the, I mean, that atmosphere in your class. Okay. Okay, okay thank you so much. Uh, another question from Hind Bere. I think she's from Nigeria. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the internet is not available in most schools, but I think we can tell learners about those online games and encourage them to play from home with peers. Thus, they, they will be using ICT as necessary 21st uh, century scale. So, so what do you think? Any alternatives? Yeah, very interesting question. Yeah, so when we talk about online games, uh, I do believe, and uh, I agree with the with hint that in remote areas, sometimes they have issues about internet connectivity, okay, internet connection. But um, I guess that the teacher, the teacher can help in this. For example, the teacher can, can have his own materials, okay, using, um, for example, his laptop and having his, uh, he, uh, he, his own um, uh, online connection and he can share with his um, students, okay. This is just one case. But in some schools, uh, in some schools, especially in, uh, in, in big cities, uh, I guess learners have got their smartphones and they have got everything, okay. Sometimes uh, my learners, they have got uh, smartphones that are much better than mine, okay. They have everything, okay, it's caring. If you are teaching in a remote area, uh, as a teacher, try to sacrifice and bring your own materials and share them with your learners. Okay, uh, another question from Hafsa uh, uh, Kazi. How frequently should we use games in the classroom? Yeah, very interesting question about the frequency of using games. Now, again, I go back to the objectives. Um, it's really good to create a fun, um, enjoyable learning environment. But the time is very important. For example, you can start with a game in the beginning as a warm up for five minutes. That's wonderful to build interest. And you can end up, you can finish. With, okay. Here's the problem if you use games for a long time. Students may not like it and they may not have that taste of playing games. Now, um, uh, the frequency, you can use them all the time. It's okay, but in the beginning at the end, that would be very helpful. Or from time to time, for example, you can use them twice or three times a week. That would be very helpful because students will like playing games. But if you use them all the time, at the end, the result, students may not have that good taste of uh, playing games in the classroom. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, for your feedback. Uh, all right, if there are any other questions, we can ponder over, we can, we can uh, discuss them at the discussion. Uh, section at the end of the webinar. So we are left with the last presentation. Okay, by, uh, okay, all right. So we have uh, the presentation number, the last one is about the importance of using games to teach English, which will be presented by uh, Habiba Daudi. So Habiba Daudi was born in 1974 in Algiers, Algeria. She graduated from the University of uh, Rosaria in Algiers in 1997. And she started teaching the same year as a substitute teacher. In 2002, she was officially confirmed as an inspector. In 2018, and after 20 years of teaching, she uh, passed the contest of supervising. 
she has been trained for one year and then she uh, now she is a supervisor for uh, of two years of practice uh, in the same district in Algiers. So welcome to the world of uh, supervision. Thank, thank you, you Habiba. Thank you. The floor is yours now. Uh, thank you. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Good evening, dear uh, uh, participants and uh, audience. Uh, I'm very delighted to be with you. Uh, and uh, thank you for this great uh, opportunity to attend such uh, important uh, webinar. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, everything was said by, uh, by the participants. Uh, using games uh, in teaching and learning. Uh, uh, before we start, uh, uh, Mr. Hussein, please. Mr. Hussein. Mr. Hussein. Uh, my presentation, please. Oh, okay, yeah, just one second. Sorry, yeah. I okay. was. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Teaching, the coming slide, please. Just one second. Mm -hmm. Second slide, please. Mm -hmm. okay, third, okay. third slide, third, number three. This one. Okay, so uh, teaching uh, teaching English vocabulary or teaching English language has undertaken radical changes uh, over the past ten, uh, two decades by implementing games in the learning process, which provides a pleasant uh, atmosphere in the classroom. So, it uh, using games encourages le uh, learners to become effective communicators in foreign languages. Since uh, teaching, uh, if, uh, uh, so, teaching has, uh, has adopted uh, new techniques and among them we have uh, using games. The word game, uh, the, the coming slide please, uh, Hussein. So what, what language game is? Yes. Games are one of the most important elements in EFL classrooms. Yes. So, and games include activities which have aims, rules, and fun. So uh, the game that teachers select to uh, or implement in a lesson should have an aim and uh, obey to rules. And uh, of course, it should based on fun. Viva. Hello. I think she has got a technical hatch. Habiba, are you there? Yeah, maybe there's a technical problem with Habiba. Okay, so we can ask if the audience can, uh, um, I mean, discuss or ask questions. What do you think, Mr. Ali? All right, so let's see if there are some questions. Uh... Okay. Um... There's a question uh, from uh, Abu Ritej. 
uh, he says, uh, how can we sympathize with students who are low achievers, uh, those students who cannot, for example, keep up with the, with the game and get high, low, low scores? I, I can say something on that. I okay. like to use, when I'm doing games, I like to use something like, for example, instead of giving teams scores or a point, they have a dice and they roll it. So they could score, they get a point, they get to roll the dice as, as the opportunity to win, but they get a score between one and six, depending on what comes up on say the dice. So therefore it's a bit of luck as well as the game. So no one feels exactly, no one can feel bad that their team doesn't win because it might, it's just up to luck on what they roll. Um, also, I found that actually games are a good way for low achievers. They get to work with and oftentimes, um, yeah, work with higher achievers. They support each other. They learn from each other. And so overall, usually the low achievers, I try to make sure that again, it's usually well spread out. I try to make sure that there's a bit of luck to the game, you know, winning the games as well, so that there isn't that feeling of, um, of not doing as well as you want or feeling fear that you are going to let your team down. Okay. Uh... Right, Habiba, are you there? Can you can you? Uh, He's back. Can you keep up, Habiba? All right. So yeah. I, I have another question for you. So what what is the the most horrible thing that may happen to you, uh, pedagogically, pedagogically speaking, <laughs> in the middle of a game? <laughs> what's what's the most horrible? to you in the middle of a game? I, I mean, uh, pedagogically speaking, not classroom management. Uh, I can I, I can react to that if you, if you allow me. Yes, sure. OK, uh, one of the things, I mean, it will happen to you. It will happen to me as a teacher if I don't take the, the necessary precautions, OK? First of all, if the game, well, OK, that I prepare, I, 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 I would fail to evaluate the value and the purpose and the tools that I'm going to use and the management, management classroom management moves that I'm going to use. Uh, uh, preparation of a game seems to me, uh, I mean, uh, requires more time, more uh, uh, thinking than a, a normal lesson. That's, uh, that's what I mentioned when it's, it's very hard to, to think of, uh, what might happen in a game, in the middle of a game, especially if, if everything goes out of control, okay? Instead of trying to, to boost the learning, you, you get chaos in the classroom. And, and students would not anymore uh, value, the, uh, would not anymore consider the value of games because your image, a teacher, uh, has spoiled everything with the, with the kids. But if there is a lot of preparation for that and good management in, in terms of grouping students and managing the tasks among the groups and creating the spirit of cooperativeness among the groups, uh, uh, you, you, it would be likely to, to, to fail. Okay, thank you so much for the uh, reaction. So uh, I have a, a question here, another one. Uh, regarding the platforms, how do you find, how do young children deal with them? Is it possible with, uh, without parental help? This is a question from uh, Erin Cotran. Uh, George can answer this question because it's... Yes, uh, I think I can answer this question. Um, it, it's another story um, having a, a platform and it's another story functioning the platform. I can tell you from experience that, especially with young learners, it, it requires a lot of training from the end of the teachers. Uh, very basic things and the most important thing, make parents your allies. I mean, the parents should be there monitoring and be part of this instruction. But it has to be pretty basic and with very, very simple things, uh, but it's very doable. I have seen it working. 
if you follow this specific uh, recipe. Okay, thank you so much. So you, you can, yeah. uh, this is uh, like in a form of a discussion. Yeah, it's, so if you have any other insights or uh, questions, you might yeah, want. It's, uh, yeah, Go it's ahead. really very interesting when we talk about discipline problems in class. Uh, sometimes, as I said in, in my presentation, that the teacher, sometimes it's hard for him to resolve a, a certain conflict, okay? So here, um, the teacher should also include parents in the process the process of dealing with these tough situations, okay? And today, you, you can either go to the administration, for example, here in Morocco, <clears throat> basically we have only uh, one important way, method, is um, we can get their, their phone, I mean the parents' phone numbers. I can go to the administration, and they say, I have got a student's name is uh, Sarah or Jamel. Maybe he is making some, or creating some troubles, okay? Uh, because the issue is a bit hard for the chief to solve with administration. So you can contact the parents and the parents can come to the administration. And then we, uh, we uh, I mean, parents are also involved in the situation. And the result is really, um, I mean, uh, positive. Okay. Okay, all right. So uh, I have a question for uh, George Kokolas. Uh, concerning gamification, uh, some people consider or regard gamification as uh, as addiction. So some of them may may consider uh, uh, gamification as an addiction. So uh, I'm asking you, as a as an expert in the field, uh, does uh, is there any negative impact of gamification on students? Of course, it can create an addiction, but um, when gamification is implemented in the right proportions, this is number one, when we try to borrow some simple elements and integrate them into our lesson, and the most important thing, addiction is a very extreme, it's an extreme state. In order someone, for someone to reach an extreme state, it's, uh, you cannot put the blame only to gamification. You cannot put the, ga the, the blame on the games that they are on the toy shop shelves. Okay, the, usually the source for this problem is that the kid does not, is not guided towards any other interests. So to keep a balanced life in between digital and maybe, you know, um, conventional world. So, yeah, in the case of addiction, it's an extreme state. Definitely, there can be people who are more specialists than me. But in order not to reach this particular level, I think balanced life, uh, and we have a huge responsibility, both as educators, parents, and teachers, to maintain this balance. A little bit of video game, a little bit of gamification, a little bit of other interests, so not to reach any addiction state. Yeah, OK, thank you. All right, so uh, I have another question for uh, Mr. Uh, maybe, maybe Ustada is ready now. Uh, are, you, are you ready, Habiba? Habiba? I still, she, she still have a technical problem. All right, so in time, she manages her, her stuff. Uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Shidudi. Uh, right. Why You have mentioned that uh, using games in Morocco is much neglected. So. Uh, are there any why why is it so why why are games uh, are neglected and you as a supervisor what do you suggest ways to uh, engage or uh, for example motivate teachers to in, in, to use but for example uh, game based learning in the class right thank you mr ali for this question but before answering you I would like to go back to this question of uh, uh, discipline in the classroom. Uh, misbehavior and misconduct is supposed to be uh, uh, minimized when introducing and then implementing games. In fact, th that's one of the, the main reasons why we want to use, not only for learning purposes, but for all, also for, for uh, good behavior in class. But those, are, uh, those students who are uh, quote unquote disruptive. Like uh, if they find an opportunity where they have to, uh, where they would have some fun, where they would play, where they would interact with other students. I mean, 
the, 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 the teacher would be on, on, a, on, uh, on a safe side. That he would not have those problems in class. Uh, for your question, for your question, I, I, I guess uh, the, the, the only stumbling block is that of uh, the syllabus or the textbook does not provide enough space or does not provide uh, space for, uh, for games to be used uh, in an instructional way, okay? Uh, maybe this answers your question, Mr. Adi, but I think uh, Lucida is back. Habiba? Uh, well, uh, micro, 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 micro. Micro. All right. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm deeply sorry. No problem. Okay, so uh, what, what language game is? Language game, I've said it's an activity that includes uh, aim, rule, and fun. Now, can we use games in all lessons? Yes, we can use the, the game uh, as a task, as an activity, either for uh, receptive skills, uh, like listening and reading, or productive skills, uh, speaking and writing, and even when teaching grammar and vocabulary. So uh, I have to mention something here. Uh, many teachers complain from uh, uh, from the unhealthy uh, noise, as you said, uh, Ali, as you said before, Ali. Uh, so uh, the teacher, I think, I, I, I don't think, I believe that the teacher should uh, be convinced by the use of uh, of game to implement it in his uh, in his lesson plan and to introduce it for his class so it's a matter of uh, of belief if i believe in something i do it okay now uh, when can a teacher implement a game when the teacher uh, i mean uh, timing is it at the beginning of the lesson is it at the middle is it by the end so here, it depends on the lesson and the, all the ob objective, the learning objective, as, said, uh, you, uh, as you have said before, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hussi. So, the, uh, and the objective of the game itself, that means uh, a game may be uh, uh, an icebreaker, maybe a warming up, that means, or a lead-in to start a lesson. Uh, a, a game can be also uh, a task to acquire a new vocabulary, item it can be uh, a task uh, to check understanding when dealing with listening or reading for example or uh, a moment to practice a new structure for example if you are uh, you are teaching for example a tense present uh, past you can introduce this through a game or it can be also meant to memorize new vocabulary okay now why are games important in teaching? Why are game, games important in teaching? So here we have several reasons. Let's take the first one. Games increase motivation and self-confidence. How? Uh, imagine, uh, let's take the same task, a task presented in an academic way, classical academic way so write uh, the the verbs are the correct tense this is academic uh, academic or uh, and uh, from the other side uh, we take the same uh, activity but i present it i implement it through a game so where do you think uh, the, the the learners are more motivated i think they are motivated when playing a game so here the aim the 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 the, the aim behind is to uh, to motivate my learners to make them learn in an implicit way Lear learning by uh, by fun learning by fun so the second uh, reason we have challenge and competition makes the learners uh, care about completing the task so uh, the learners when they are learning or when they are playing a game here we have th this aspect of challenge and uh, this aspect of the competition. So they are, they are um, in a hurry to finish, to complete the task. Whereas if it, the, the, the task is academic, they, feel they, they finish by feeling bored, especially if the, the, the task is long. 
Now we move to the se- to the to the another uh, to the another uh, cause or reason. We have learners develop their ability to observe how, uh, when they are playing, even those who are not uh, doing the task or ju- uh, it's not their turn, they are observing. They are observing their learner, their their colleagues, their mates playing. So here, uh, in directly uh, indirectly not directly indirectly we are going to uh, to develop that skill that skill of observing uh, and even the teacher here when uh, when observing his learners doing a task i think that it's a crucial moment to to uh, to see where they fail to see their uh, their uh, their mistakes and from uh, and from 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 that moment, he can he or she as teacher can prepare something to re, to uh, to uh, consolidate to consolidate his uh, his uh, learners' uh, mistakes. Okay. Now, games also develop that critical thinking, critical thinking, and uh, problem solving and imagination. That means uh, a game. Is, the game is a problem problem solving situation so the learners are asked to solve this problem that is what we mean by developing the critical thinking and problem solving and imagination now uh, there is another point which is immediate feedback here the immediate feedback is uh, both for teachers and learners so the result of the task is seen is uh, is seen and appeared uh, immediately we don't wait finish the session or to review to discover this uh, this uh, to see the feedback so the feedback is immediate timing what do you mean by time timing is respected what what do you mean by this i think uh, i think that uh, when you present when you present uh, a game to your learners so from the beginning you will agree on timing so my learners you are going to play a game but you have five minutes for example or 10 minutes to finish it so all uh, we both teachers and lear- teacher and learners agree on timing from the beginning so timing is respected something that we don't see in uh, ordinary tasks and activities now the games also facilitate and promote collaborative learning and the co- collaborative learning is uh, mainly the main important uh, element in the 20th century uh, skills. This is for uh, the importance of teaching games. Now, there is another point. What are the elements that a teacher should take into consideration in uh, to insert games in the, uh, in a lesson? So the game. I think that the game should be uh, should have a name. We don't play to play in a classroom otherwise uh, we will uh, we will finish by having uh, a jungle or, or a, a battle file, uh, field sorry games also should focus on the use of language so uh, we should keep in mind that uh, using game in a classroom has a purpose which is the use of language in EFL classes now games also should not promote wrong values we never teach wrong values here we have to respect the cultural and regional uh, and uh, the cultural background of the of the pupils of the learners sorry now also games should be easy and doable we don't give uh, hard hard games to our learners also games should be suitable to learners age and level we should keep in mind and take into consideration the age of our learners and their level their knowledge level games also should be uh, short why they should be short when choosing short games we we, uh, we uh, our learners won't be uh, bored doing uh, uh, long games uh, and so so to, to avoid boredom we have to choose uh, short games that's all
Thank you so much, uh, Habiba, for your. Uh, You're welcome. Your, your, uh, I want to add. Uh, I, want, I want to add something, if you allow yeah, go, me. Uh, yeah, Sarai. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'll take uh, the example of uh, my country. Here in my country, in uh, in the educational system, uh, uh, for teaching English, we have uh, an extra hour, w w which which is called the the tutorial session. The tutorial session is a, a session uh, that we devote to uh, consolidate, cons consolidate uh, teaching, yes. So uh, as a supervisor, I advise, I always advise my, uh, my teachers to, uh, to uh, teach or to read teach uh, the, the the, uh, any element, for example, grammar, vocabulary, uh, in a, an academic way during this session. So I ask them, generally I ask them, or, or uh, I encourage them to, to deal with games. And I remember that uh, one, one day I have attended a lesson, lesson, not a tutorial session, with uh, one of my uh, active teachers. She was dealing with the phonetics, lesson of phonetics, and all the lesson was presented through games, and it was very, very, very amazing to see uh, to see uh, the, the learners evolve, uh, learning uh, in a fun way. It was amazing. It was really amazing. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mrs. Daudi Habiba, for your uh, interesting You're presentation. Uh, I guess you have one question here. Mm. Yes. Uh, You're from... welcome from Hasna Ubaha. Uh, since, mm -hmm. I, I will rephrase the question. Uh, since uh, uh, games are uh, like uh, competition, so how can you behave, how can you deal with, with students who are uh, uh, especially losers, those who lose in a game, how do you and do not accept the, 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 the loss of in a game? How do you deal with those? Sorry, they? How do you deal with those students who lose in a game and can and they do not accept it? They they don't accept the, the, that they lose. That the fact that they lose in a, in a game. But Especially we have we have to accept in a game in a game <laughs> in a game we have. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, that such questions are are meant to to uh, to Especially avoid primary. Especially using primary. using games in the class. So we have to accept. In any game, in any game, the, the, there is a loser and a winner. So I don't think it's a very, very big problem. He yeah. will, uh, he he loses today. He will, uh, he will win uh, tomorrow. Okay, all right. Maybe this question can be uh, uh, raised uh, to, to the uh, uh, our guest speakers, and Why and not? we start this yeah. a general discussion of the webinar. So ah. the floor is yours, all of you. So you can, you can if you allow me, Ali. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, I just take uh, uh, Habiba's view uh, that there is always a loser and a winner. And a winner. Yes, yeah. yes it is. But uh, uh, it, 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 you, you were uh, you were mentioned you mentioned some of the crucial roles of the teacher. Okay, one of those roles is not to instill the, this spirit of competitiveness to the extent of being antagonism among the students. Yes, of course. It should only be used lightly. As you said, you, you can train them to accept uh, being defeated, but not to the, to the extent of ha having it as a very competitive, because this would create uh, some sort of uh, uh, hatred among the group, maybe among the students. But if it's taken lightly, just uh, uh, in a playful way, that, that would work, I, I guess. All right. Yes, Mr. Casiras. Uh, your your mic. Your mic. Yeah, I think it's a very important point. So uh, all the time when I use the game, I stick to my objectives. So I don't opt for winning for a winning situation. I don't encourage my learners that that um, uh, there is a winner, a very good job, and the loser. But it's collaboration all the time. In my classes, yeah, there is a winner and a loser, but both are collaborating because the most important is at the end, they are going to learn. Because if we encourage, 
if we encourage uh, that this team is the winner and we say bravo very good job this is the the loser we are instilling wrong values as mr habiba said okay so we don't have to promote wrong values okay it's great to, when you when you are using games it's great to um to promote collaboration yes. working together okay this, like it's a win-win game win-win mm. the way all winners all winners are the all winners a loser but the end yeah if if a student knows that they have learned something then they are automatically a winner yeah, yeah. exactly and i think that's one thing we have to be careful of as teachers is also our own language um i always discourage using the term loser because if you participated if you learned something then oh, we know. You're, you're you're not a loser you're you're you participated and that's great so it's it's changing their mind mindset and also our teachers mindset of how we approach that yes all right any other comments any other insights um oh, i have a question for uh brian rogers uh, uh I, you have you have uh, said that you can use games to assess students so how re reliable and valid is uh, assessment when you use games? Well, it depends on, uh, again, I don't know, maybe if oh, you can use you me, Mr. Uh, Ali? gamification yes, for I formal no, evaluation. It's, it's a little tougher. But again, you're using, a, using it so that I tend to use it for more formative assessment, which is so I can see what I need to go back and re reteach, redo with the students. And I think the problem is that oftentimes as teachers, we don't pay attention to what's happening during the game. We sort of let things go. And as teachers, you need to be very attentive to what language are they using? Are they using the language that you wanted to, them to use? Um, are they um, using the language correctly? What, if not, what do I need to go, what do we need to go back and review? So I think you can, um, I believe you can use it for assessment, especially like I said, um, formative assessment more than more of a formal assessment. Yes, that's okay. Yes. Uh, any other final comments? Can I add something, please? Uh, yes, Habiba, go Ali. ahead. Thank Habiba, you. go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think that um, we have to mention that uh, using games and uh, using songs is the way to uh, to make uh, the learners uh, work. That means learner learner-centered uh, learning not teacher-centered learning. So here, uh, the, the role of uh, the teacher will be uh, a monitor. He will, he will monitor, he will observe only, maybe help, help them maybe. But here, uh, all the work is going to be done by the learners themselves. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. any other ideas? Any final thoughts? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I thank you. We are about to, to uh, about to. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have just two minutes, if you, you allow. Uh, I think even when the teachers are not using games as such, they they sometimes use their own uh, talents. They use the humor to 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 to, to create a very uh, a very. Uh, conducive atmosphere for, for the students. And that's the purpose. Yes. Uh, I mean, y y you make them feel, you make the, the students feel relaxed so that they can learn. That's the most important. Whether it's uh, for uh, uh, as a starter, whether it's in the middle, whether it's at the end of the session, but uh, it's just a question of instilling this culture of uh, gamification in, in, in the students. To, 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 so they so they later they will know that you are using game for a purpose that they should be, be ready for for, for it. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Ali, and your guests or your guests. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah. I guess uh, I guess I, it's um, it's too late for Brianna yeah. Rogers. What time is All it right. there? Uh, it oh gosh, it is three thirty. All right, a.m. a.m. 
Okay. Wow, so sorry, yeah. All right, so I guess the way the webinar has come to an end and that the objective of the webinar has been achieved, uh, hopefully. So I am making a call for all teachers out there who are following us on Facebook to, for, to go for innovation. That's a very important element in, uh, in teacher's CPD, is to innovate and try things out and one of those things, one of those things, yes, yeah, try, try, trying out new things, and th th that's the 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 the, the, the uh, exploring the potential of teachers, uh, using games. If they if they work, that's fine. If they do not work, you you know that it, they don't work, and you you do something else. So that's being part uh, being re reflective. So it's up to the teachers to use games in the classroom and see yeah. the feasibility of using those games in for educational purposes uh, and also it's up to them to choose what games which are appropriate for the for the level of their students and when and how to apply those games so i believe that now you have very practical hints and uh, you have a, a, a full understanding of how engaging games are so make the best of those games and thank you so much thank you uh, thank, thank you, Brianna Rogers from the United States, and uh, thank you, uh, Abdelkader Shadoudi from Morocco, and thank you, Mr. George Kokolas from Greece, and thank you, uh, Mrs. Habiba Dawdi from Algeria, and thank you, Mr. Qasiras Hussein from Morocco. You, you've been amazing, and thank you for your time and for your patience. And also, I would like to thank all our attendees overseas and in Morocco for their um, following and uh, and I'm looking for, we are looking forward, all of us, to uh, meeting in new events. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, much. Algeria, Greece, USA, Vietnam, Morocco. Thanks a lot for making this. Welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.